From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS 12 exchanges and six clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome inside the ICE house. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Let's take a trip back to October 1986. The Mets are winning the World Series in seven games thanks to Mookie Wilson's dribbler through the legs of the Red Sox first baseman Billy Buckner in Game 6 in Shea Stadium in Queens. Now, over in Lower Manhattan, let's switch the action to 85 Broad Street, the old headquarters of Goldman Sachs, the legendary investment firm with NYSE ticker symbol GS that now resides in a gleaming office tower at 200 West Street, which last year the firm marked its 150th anniversary since its founding back in 1869. 1986 again, John Weinberg, then the senior partner at the firm, picked up his phone and began to individually dial the phone numbers of 37 of his best employees. On the other end of each call was someone selected to join the ranks of Goldman's illustrious partnership. The impact of those storied phone calls, now more likely a cell phone than a landline, was the jumping-off point for a conversation with our guest today, John Winkleried, himself a longtime Goldman partner, even once in line to run Goldman when he served as its co-president from 2006 to 2009, and he's now the co-chief executive officer of TPG Capital, one of the largest private equity companies in the world. Now, the invitation to new partners initiated by that phone call has been a yearly event at Goldman, but something new happened on that day, 1986, 34 years ago. On Mr. Weinberg's call list was Jeanette Loeb and Garland Wood, who that year became the first female and African-American partners in the firm's history. Those quick calls had massive reverberations because, to paraphrase New York Stock Exchange President Stacey Cunningham on following in the footsteps of Muriel Siebert during her own path to membership of the exchange, no one else would ever again have to wonder if it was even possible. The addition of Ms. Loeb and Mr. Wood was part of an effort that continues today at Goldman to add partners who represent not just diverse backgrounds, but bring a range of experience outside the historic focus of the investment banking and securities divisions of the firm. The effect of this can be seen in the most recent class of partners from 2018, The 69 candidates represented 13 different divisions of the company, hailed from 18 different countries, and nearly a third were under the age of 35. Included in that group was the highest percentage of women and people of color in the history of the company. Our special host today interviewing John Winkleried is someone intimately familiar with this process. Christina Minnis became a Goldman partner in 2008 and is now the firm's global head of acquisition finance, reaching that plateau after joining in 1998 with leadership roles in investment banking, fixed income, and the consumer retail and healthcare group, among others. The conversation between Christina and John was recorded live on stage at the recent New York Stock Exchange Board Advisory Council Networking Summit before a gathered audience of nearly 60 board candidates and representatives from 22 companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange looking to add new diverse directors. The next voice you will hear after the break is Christina's. Her conversation with TPG Capital co-CEO John Winkleried on what it takes to serve on a company's board, the differences between sitting on a private versus a public board, and why TPG ties executive compensation directly to improving diversity. That's right after this. And now a word from ICE's global head of oil sales and market. Across global oil markets, the shale revolution and Asian demand have shifted trade flows. 
New regulations are impacting our customers. IMO 2020 completely changes shipping economics. We offer the most liquid global crude and refined markets with regional pricing across the barrel. Built on Brent, Dubai, and Permian TI, our crude complex offers critical risk management tools. Around 75% of OI and derivatives of oil benchmarks is held at ICE. In refined products, gas oil is the global benchmark with pricing points all over the world. Designed for the commercial trader, ICE offers a truly global oil product suite. Well, thank you. And I can't say how pleased uh, we are to be here. Uh, this is something that's very near and dear to both John's and my heart. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on him because it's incredibly impressive. And he was my boss once upon a time, hired me, yep. hired me and actually made the phone call when I made partner at Goldman Sachs. And if, those of you, that's kind of probably the most important day in your life besides getting married and having your first child is when that phone call comes in from the president of Goldman Sachs asking you to be a partner. I remember exactly where I was. John's background is incredibly, I think, relevant in many ways. Co-chief executive officer and partner of TPG today, was formerly with Goldman Sachs for 27 years. He retired in 2009 as the president and C, um, chief operating officer. Um, he became a partner of the firm in 1990. And he had a, a series of leadership positions around the firm, which I actually also think is really relevant as we think about our own careers in terms of the importance of operating experience. For example, he was on the management committee of the firm. He was on the partnership committee of the firm, capital committee, and founding chairman of business practices committee of the firm. And he also served on our own board of directors um, at the firm. Prior to joining TPG, he managed his own firm, JW Capital Partners, with investments across a range of industries, including technology, real estate, healthcare, one of my personal faves, and natural resources. Was also a strategic advisor and partner at Thrive Capital, a New York-based venture capital firm focused on technology investing, and also is an advisor to TSSP Six Street Partners, which is TPG's special situations group and credit platform. Curly sits on a number of boards, Evolution Media, McAfee, Delos Living, LLC, Anastasia Beverly Hills, Bounty Minerals and Cadre also serves on the board of overseers for Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is another question I'm going to pose about the importance of charitable boards versus public boards. Also serves as trustee of uh, University of Chicago, received his B in economics from University of Chicago in 81, and MBA from University of Chicago in 82. And you're currently, I believe, yes, on the board of trustees of Vanderbilt. Yeah. Yeah. So... Long history. And so I think what I want to first start with, and this is something that you and I kind of came up with a few years ago. My alma mater, Yale, approached me about maybe doing an executive program focusing on C-suite women that have not yet been on a public company board. And what they were trying to get at was the fact that there's a finite group of women that are currently sitting on public company boards. Many of the search firms, the first question out of their mouth when they say, we'd love to have a candidate, but must have had public company board experience, you get into this like vicious circle of going back to the same candidates. And so I actually thought Yale was kind of onto something. At the same time, John and I had, had lunch in California, and he had mentioned to me that he had come out with a mandate inside of TPG to mandate each of the control private equity companies have a female director, I think at the time, by a certain period of time, a couple of years. Yep. And then about three months later, they say the California came out with its edict. And so John and I have been talking about this topic for a long time, and one of the things that we thought was really interesting is contrasting a private equity board and the experience that you might have on a private equity board and how that could translate to a public company board. And so why don't we start with having sat on the Goldman Sachs board, public company. I also believe, is it McAfee Public or what, what are the other? No, not, no, not, not yet. yet. Not, not yet. yet. But currently sit on a number of private boards. How do you see that dichotomy of experience? First of all, in terms of participating on a board, I mean, you have to start somewhere, right? Our thesis at the firm was that broadly, I think we felt like diversity of thought and diversity of view and diversity of experience was very important to our portfolio and to our portfolio companies. So as Christina mentioned, we decided that we were gonna undertake a program at TPG to, and it's a little bit more expansive than you described, we decided that we would change the, the starting with the gender diversity composition of all of the boards 
where we either have control or we have considerable influence. So there are a lot of investments where we don't have control, but we have considerable influence as a minority investor. So we decided we were, that, that was a, it was about 20 months ago that we kind of set out on this journey to, to basically do this. And we did a lot of work in terms of evaluating how could we think about candidates to, to, to you know, women, women who would be interested, capable of serving on these boards. And so we began to develop a variety of different um, initiatives to source candidates for these boards. We started out by actually just going to our own network and basically saying, if you know women who have a lot of great experiences, doesn't matter if they've been on a board or not on a board, but have a lot of great experiences, a lot of great expertise. We, so we set up a thing at, in our, within our human capital team called ta- basically called Talent at TPG, and through that vehicle, we had people route through either introductions or resumes or whatever, basically people into that. And amazingly, th- through that, as well as a number of external relationships we developed with different organizations that were focused on uh, the, de- the development of women for potentially for board positions or different cohort groups, we have developed a database. I'll come back to this later, may- maybe, by the way. But we, can- we developed a database of almost 800 women who are really very special and capable of adding value on a number of different types of boards and and a number of different types of roles. And we're actually, you know, we're actually, besides placing women ourselves on our own boards, we're actually trying to figure out what to actually do with that database because it's, I think it's a very valuable um, list of of talented people. Can you share that with Goldman Sachs? No, no. no, no. (laughs) We're, We're actually, no, we're actually, seriously, we're actually thinking about how can we share it because we've got all these very qualified women on this list and sort of, you know, so we don't want to work. So just to put, just to put some parameter, parameters around it, we have added in the last basically 18 months, we've added 64 women to about 55, 56 of our boards. And that's impressive. And um, it's in some cases, it's more than one. In some cases, there is some other form of diversity associated with it as well. But our focus has basically been gender diversity as a way to basically start this process. We're now beginning to kind of move it into other categories of diversity, as you would expect. What we also did internally is we have this process of our board diversity initiative is a special segment of the partner level and principal level people in the firm, it's a special segment of their review. So when they come in for their review at the end of the year, there's actually a single page among the pages that we have for somebody's review besides attribution for deals, value creation, all the other stuff that we look at in our industry. There's a page that basically has their portfolio companies, the composition of their boards, women added, you know, there might, be, there might have been pre-existing women on the board. This is sort of attribution for women actually added. And if it's really good, we are, you know, we're recognizing that. If it's really bad, we're recognizing that as well. And it's affecting how people get rewarded and compensated and advanced in the organization. So, you know, there's no, there's no better way to kind of get people's attention than to focus them with respect to their review and the, their annual compensation and how they move through the organization, particularly in an organization like this or at Goldman Sachs for that matter, because I'm kind of familiar with how that works. When you get into the subject of public boards and private boards, it's really kind of an interesting conversation. You know, the single biggest difference, this is changing a little bit, is that investor, that private boards are dominated basically by people who are either acting as or have a mindset, have a investor's mindset an investor's lens. That's how the boards are dominated on the private side. That's changing a little bit as well because particularly as it relates to kind of value creation and and depending on where a company is in its life cycle, there are other skills, there's other expertise that are needed on private side boards. So, you know, I, for instance, I chair the board of McAfee, which is a big purity software business, and we have brought two women on the board now since I've been on it. One basically has a sort of a deep 
what I would call sort of broadly oper corporate operating experience and has, sit on, and has sat on a number of public boards. And we were trying to bring some sort of more structure and kind of public board influence in terms of governance to our private board. So that's why we did that. And another is coming as if coming from the place where she is a CFO of a public company and we're trying to bring in more public company audit side experience in that particular case because the company is evolving to a point where we feel that's necessary. Prior to that, the board was basically dominated by two of us plus others sitting around the room from TPG, one person from Toma Bravo. So there was a very much of kind of an investor's mindset and that investor's mindset is generally focused on value creation inside the company, right? Uh, you know, um, what are we doing in terms of, what are the key levers and drivers of value creation? For different companies, it's different things. You know, in that company, as an example, you know, the focus of the, the kind of the real value driver, the, that, that company has got an enterprise business and a consumer business, and the key value driver there is growing the enterprise side of the business. Um, and so a lot of focus on kind of go to market, a lot of focus on you know, how, how we drive the margins in the business and the cost of go to market, et cetera. Now um, the company is out, uh, the company is, was was the, that was a carve out from Intel. It's been stood up on its own now. The company is evolving into its next phase, and so the needs in terms of governance around that the board. board's also very small. It's seven or eight people. Yeah, now it's about eight. Yes, right. Which yes. is also, I think, if you think the average private equity board, I think, is between seven and eight. Yep. And often there's just currently probably just one outsider, right? So it's a smaller organization. It's yeah, well, there's now three outsiders on that board. On that board. But I'm just saying, if you looked at the average private equity portfolio yeah. company, it's probably a smaller board, which I think also gets to a little bit of the differences between a public company board and yeah. a private board, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, when you consider outsiders, I mean, there's a difference between executives versus the private equity sponsors and then true outsiders, right? right? And public company boards, you know, I think that the, the makeup of co public... Uh, company boards obviously is the, the, the focus and the and the and the and the, uh, the functionality of the board obviously is is divided mostly in committee work and committee structure. But again, this is changing a little bit. I think until recently, public boards were not there. There was probably less of an investor and kind of value creation mindset around public company boards for a long time. Now there are forces that are changing that. Right? I mean, there's. There's uh, activist forces that are beginning to change mm -hmm. that. You know, there are various forces that are changing that. But I would say if I were to distill it down to sort of, you know, uh, uh, the substantive difference, I would say that that investor mindset dominating around the table in a private company board context is probably the primary difference between that and public company boards. Besides, obviously, the way the boards work and, and, and just the, the flow of activity and the committee structure, I mean, some private company boards have some committee structure. Some have no committee structure whatsoever. So, I also think with a lot of these private equity companies growing and getting larger and larger, the exit opportunities set for these private equity investments, there's also the IPO, right, which is yep. a very you know attractive way to start at a, a private board, understand the company, and then take it public. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, once you get to a point where you think you might be exiting through a public offering you start focusing on public company readiness, right? And public company readiness involves a lot of things. You know, if it's, there's financial structure, there's audits, there's board structure, and you wanna be able to move from sort of where you are in a private context into a public context pretty seamlessly without, you know, a lot of disruption. You know, you obviously have made great progress. Um, at Goldman, I think we're incredibly proud of the progress that we've made. I think the last four ads have been diverse. I think David's incredibly committed to this as a key agenda item for inclusion and diversity. I think the board at Goldman now is 54% diverse across race, gender, and LGBTQ. And so we're really excited. You've added you know, 50 plus people to your boards. Why do you think the progress is, is, is as slow as it is, right? Because if you look at other countries, constituencies around the world, in Europe, they've made great strides, right? And I think yep. it's still slower here. You know, why is that, do you think? And what can we in this room be doing more of mm -hmm. to continue to advance it? Yeah, well, it's a good question. I mean, I think, first of all, public company boards, as far as the numbers are concerned, are ahead of private side boards. So, and that's probably because of who's making the decisions and how decisions are being made and what the external pressures are. I mean, we decided to proactively take this on, but I think that so, You're the outlier. Well, so back to your question, I mean, why? I mean, 
Well, first of all, I think, I mean, there's num number one, there's just bias. There's sort of the kind of the notion that lots of boards are populated with influence from, and again, this is different for public and private, okay? So, because there are certain kind of governance controls around some of this stuff, but just generally, I mean, lots of boards are populated with people who the CEO or someone who's very influential on the board kind of knows and feels comfortable with. And that's, you know, if, if more, if management and those people are more likely to be white males, well then, guess what? Guess who's gonna be, you know, the next, the next guy on, right? It's gonna be a, probably a white male. So I think there's just general bias in the system that causes that to perpetuate. If you wanna change that, you've gotta kinda of break the cycle and you've gotta be sort of particularly aggressive about breaking the cycle. So that's one example. Another is- And um, that breaking the cycle's gotta come from the buy side? In terms of well, it, it it I think that's one place where it can come, but it can also come from other influences. Like Christina, you were telling me before about what's happened in France, as an yes. example, where there are kind of legislative legislative initiatives which require a certain different kind of approach with respect to governance and the board and and who's sitting around the board. So it could come from that as you well. You think our country would ever go there? Well. California's doing it. That's the country. So goes the country. <laughs> I'm not, I mean, you're from New Jersey. Let's, I'm not, let's I'm be from clear. New Jersey, so. You're from New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. I, can attest, <laughs> I can attest that California is not quite the same country <laughs> as where I'm from. But, you know, look, you, you know, I mean, you don't, uh, I don't know. I mean, crazier things have been proposed. So I'm not sure it's completely out of the question. So, you know, there are those kinds of influences. But I think that investor an in investor pressure is probably the most profound and the most direct, right? Because at the end of the day, in a public company, obviously, that's who you're working for. You're working for the stockholders, right? So you have a responsibility there. So if investors press enough, and we've obviously seen activist strategies that have pressed a lot on different companies, and they've made a, it's changed a lot of things. In our case, as a private organization with, with private companies, I think, How you many know, do you have again, right? 140? Is that 100 and probably, you know, probably 160 plus portfolio companies of different sizes and different types. But for, from, from our perspective, obviously, remember who we're working for, right? Our investors are firemen, Tomasa, teachers, GIC, policemen, <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of mostly big public pension funds that we're working for. So they should have pretty strong opinions about this. Interestingly enough, I would say that, you know, I've been in my current job now as co-CEO for four years, and I would say in the first at least two years of doing this job and meeting with almost all of our LPs, I could count probably on one hand the number of LPs that raised this issue. That was generally. Two, years, two years ago. That was two years ago, prior two years meeting with all of our LPs, I could probably count on one hand the number of LPs that would proactively kind of ask me about any form of diversity. Diversity in our firm, diversity on our boards, any form. In the last two years, it's definitely kind of ticked up in terms of people's kind of consciousness about it and their focus on it. It's now become something that's more routine as it relates to, the, like if we're raising a new fund, in the diligence process for a new fund, it's, it's been now become more of a routine question that people are asking, but not as much pressure as you would think. I think the other area that I've seen personally that makes a big difference, and I think New York Stock Exchange, Goldman Sachs, we have a really interesting opportunity. We get asked a lot. Companies will call up and say, God, I'd love to add a diverse board member. Do you know somebody? And so I think one thing we can also do is just kind of own that whole networking effect ourselves because I, I can speak from experience that we all have influence outside of the executive search firms, et cetera. Yep. And I think most of the board placements um, tend to happen through people you know, word of mouth versus placement. Yeah, I mean, there is a pretty active executive search program now for placements for board members. And, that, and now, you know, a lot of the executive search firms have kind of gotten the joke and they've kind of focused on diversity and diverse candidates. but. You can call us, we have 800 of them, so. Uh, you said you wouldn't give me the database. You, I would. What about um, the activism comment? Because I think that's a pretty interesting one, which is, it came up actually at, with Jeff Sonnenfeld up at Yale, the concept of, you know, if certain public company boards would think a little bit more like 
owners of companies versus mm -hmm. maybe stewards of governance or stewards of the downside management in terms of risk management, would activism have such a prominent role going forward? What do you think? I think that activism will, I mean, activism is focused on, there are different activists in the market and they're focused on different things. I think most activists are focused on buying stock and then figuring out how to sell it at a higher price. So I think <laughs> that this is likely not to be a primary focus of activists and activism. There may be other forms of shareholder activism. There's, there are the beginnings, by the way, of what I would call activist impact strategies where there are, there's, there are some pools of capital now that are basically focusing on things like ESG. And there are some pools of capital now focused on becoming more activist as it relates to trying to invest in a company and then apply various pressures to making a company more accountable and more focused on ESG related matters. So if diversity becomes part of that in a core way, I think you're gonna to start to see more activist pressure from the market in this category. And we have a fairly high profile impact strategy as part of um, TPG, which we call the Rise Fund, which is, a, which is private investing in private companies. It's not public companies. But one of the things that we've been looking at is we've been looking at exploring, extending the Rise impact strategy to a public side um, a strategy. And we're in dialogue with someone that is actually creating exactly what I just described, mm. who's got a background as a very successful, what I would call activist slash kind of constructivist. So this, that's an area where I think you'll see more pressure, pressure applied ultimately. Is the premise, I, mean, I actually saw an article, I showed it to you before the um, lunch, someone did some data on 2,200 investments and looked at in those situations where there was a lead female investor, the IRR on that investment was up by 12%, which is, you know, pretty, pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, you think it's being driven because diversity yields better returns as well as it's the right thing to do? Well, I think it's being driven by some combination of diversity and broader ESG kind of topics. We're evolving into a world where, you know, some people use the expression responsible capitalism, et cetera, things like that. I, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I do know that consumers and customers of all of our companies care more today about responsible governance and the way we run our companies and what we stand for and what our core principles are. And it is affecting consumption behavior. It's affecting consumption behavior. So I do, I do think that there's a fundamental element of being aware of if you're running a company and you're thinking about how am I gonna position my company and put my company in the best position possible to grow and to, and to, and to uh, and drive shareholder value, I need to be cognizant of what's happening in my customer base and, what, and my user base. Right. And that, that, that is, it's clearly shifting. So I think there's a relationship, if you follow that all the way through, between the performance of your company and then worrying about these types of issues, whether it's diversity or various ESG initiatives, how are we managing our company and what do we stand for, what's our core value set, I do think ultimately those things end up meeting. And sometimes it takes time before they do meet, but I think they will. If you're comfortable sharing some of the most tense sort of moments on a board you've been participating in, maybe not Goldman Sachs, because we've got some Goldman Sachs people here, but if you, you think about controversial situations on boards, what board members and what attributes of those board members really stood out to you as you try to get through crisis? And you obviously experienced a fair amount of that in your past. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I think generally coming to the table with a sort of a true kind of ownership mentality and partnership mentality as opposed to kind of a got you or kind of, you know, I don't know, you know, some people, you, you know, like maybe the kind of Monday morning quarterback kind of like, you know, I, I told you you should have done that or 
I think that's important because when things get tough or you get into a kind of crisis mode, I think coming together is pretty important. And you, you hear the comment, fit. We're always looking for fit on a board. And I get worried when I hear that word because that to me strikes of, Bias. you don't look like me. Yeah, yeah. So how do you deal with cultural fit versus what you're just talking about? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, I don't have a simple answer for that in terms of sort of fit other than I think you have to force yourself when you're obviously composing your board to have some standards about having diversity. And if you have some standards about it, you're looking at, that, you're look, you're looking at people through that lens, right? It's like when somebody goes out and says, you know, I need to hire somebody, and they come back and they have three candidates and they're all white males, and you say, well, do you have any diverse candidates? If you force people into a mode where you're not gonna give them head count unless they basically start looking at it that way, then, you, then people then start to be more creative and a little bit more open-minded as to what they're looking at, right? So it's just a behavioral thing. And I think board composition, if you have, you know, again, public company, private company might be different. In a public company context, you have a committee that's dealing with, you know, kind of director candidacy and governance. Right. And that is a core part of what that committee does, right? A core part. When you have a private company board, it's a little bit different in that it's sort of, a small group of people that are kind of driving, well, who's gonna compo compose the board? So you also have to have some kind of initiative or some kind of discipline as to, like, you gotta be more, you have to be open-minded and, 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 and broad-minded about how we're, how we're thinking about this, and so obviously that's why we did what we did. But again, back in crisis, I think, you know, um, you know people coming together is one thing. I think, you know, having people on your board that have, have had, you know, when I was, when I was 40, I never thought like, you know, it was really, you know, I always thought I had all the answers and I never thought that actually time and experience really was that important. Now that I'm 60, I think it's really important. Um, and so, um, you know, some level of time and experience and having lived through some like tough stuff actually is valuable. I mean, you know, we had a situation this year where in March we had one of our most senior partners was arrested in the Varsity Blues scandal. And so, you know, that person was sort of, there one day and gone the next. And um, so we had to go into sort of crisis management mode. And, you know, having lived through a few of those things before in my career, whether it was, you know, dealing with crisis around 9-11 or, you know, other, other types of, you know, dealing with crisis in September of 2008, you know, uh, at, at which point I was on the Goldman board and, you know, and, and uh, among other things, you kind of begin to learn these reps about like, you know, what, are, what is important? You know, how do you stabilize your organization? How do you communicate? Um, hopefully over communicate. You know, how do you keep people that don't need to be focused on the crisis, focused on other things, that kind of stuff. So having people around a board table that have some experience with stuff like that, I think is very valuable. So th that's, that's a real valuable you know, attribute in a situation like that. Because your CEO, by the way, you know, may not have lived through um, crisis. In the last 10 years have been, has been nothing but up. Somebody that was 23 in 2010, right, you know, is, um, is 32 now in a much more senior position and was a student during the financial crisis. So, you know, that experience is really very, very valuable. So I think having that around the You are talking your own book, you know that. What do you mean? You're Because I'm old? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, just. Well, I still have, I got to, I have to be relevant somehow. Thanks, everybody. And thanks to New York Stock Exchange sure. for having us. Thank you. Thanks for joining us inside the Ice House. Our episode this week with TPG Capital co-CEO John Winkleried and Christina Minnis, Goldman Sachs's global head of acquisition finance, was recorded live at the New York Stock Exchange Board Advisory Council Networking Summit. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Pete Ash with production assistance from Ken Abel and Ian Wolf. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week.
Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 